Good morning, family and friends. It's good to have you here at Valley Community Church, and yes, we are a church. I grew up hearing this all of the time. The church is not a building. The church is not a building. And I believe that, and I taught that. But it hasn't been until recently that I've really struggled with it personally because it's hard for me to function in a way that I really haven't had to function before. And I'm sure that that's true for you as well. We had shared earlier that the first 300 years of the church, as the church flourished, they did not have buildings. And yet they still were able to accomplish what a church is and what a church does. So what would characterize, if someone asked you this question, what is a church? What makes up a church? I would say there are three things. One is it is a community of believers. It's not just a crowd. It's not just a gathering. It is a community, a family of believers who minister and care with one another. Secondly, it is a place of worship, not physical location, but the activity that these believers come together and they worship God in song and music and praise in prayer and in the preaching and teaching of God's Word. They also share the Lord's table, communion, which is one part that we're still trying to figure out. But it is for that purpose, the teaching, preaching of the Word, prayer, music and worship and song and thanksgiving and gathering around the Lord's table to remember His death, burial and resurrection. The third part of what really makes a church is being on mission. We have been placed on this earth, and Jesus gave this command at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, go and make disciples of all nations. And when you think about what that means, a disciple is a follower of Jesus. And so Jesus said, follow me, and then he said, go make other followers of me. And so we need to be on mission. And so far, I think that we've been able to do this during our COVID time. We've been able to uh, minister in community. Uh, sometimes it's virtually, sometimes Zoom, sometimes a phone call, sometimes a smaller gathering with masks and six feet in distance. Uh, but we've been able to maintain that community. We've been able to worship and we're worshiping this morning together. It's a little bit different, but we're able to teach God's word, sing together, and we're also able to pray together. And then finally, to be on mission. And I think we've probably seen over the last few months more fruit of people coming to Jesus than we have since the beginning of the church and I of Valley Community Church which is incredibly encouraging to me that we can be following Jesus and going and making disciples so I'm still looking forward to the time where we can gather together in the same place the same building and see all the faces but let's just give thanks to the Lord that we're able to still be the church as he has called us out to be I'd like to encourage you to join us on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock by Zoom. And I know a lot of you may be tired of Zoom or you're just not into Zoom, but there's several ways you can do this. From 7 to 7.30, I'm going to share a challenge. We're going to mention some blessings and answers to prayer that we've seen with our church family, and then we're also going to pray together. Uh, we'll be done at 7.30. We've been doing that regularly. And if you come on, you just click the link. If you, if you don't have the link, uh, ask us and we'll send it to you. And you can be invisible. You don't have to have a video shot of yourself. You can mute yourself so you're not heard. So you can just be listening in. But I really believe that during this time, it's important for as many of you to join us on that call at 7 o'clock each Wednesday because you hear what's happening. You hear what God's doing in the lives of our people. You hear their needs. And we stay encouraged. So would you do that this week? I, I hope this week is our best attendance and that it's profitable that you move on from that point and are, are super encouraged by being able to meet together as a church family. Now this morning, Paul Ice will be preaching. We look forward to the message that he'll be bringing out of Psalm 46. I thank the Lord that our church has a number of very competent and gifted preachers. And all of the, the preachers you're gonna hear this month as we go through the summer in the Psalms will be from Valley. Uh, Paul, of course, you know. Craig, you know he'll be at the end of this month. But Jonathan Farmer next week is one of our global partners. He's part of our family. He'll be preaching uh, next Sunday from Singapore. And then Reed Olson will be preaching from Palau, Micronesia. And then Josh Neighbors, who's one of our locals here, and then Craig. And each one of them is taking a psalm. Psalms are, are, are tremendous for the soul because they're, they're like prayers to God through song and they express our condition and our needs. And I find them incredibly encouraging. 
You can also pray for me this month because I'm, I'm still around, I'm still available, but I'm focusing on our next series of messages, which will be starting in the book of 1 Corinthians, which I think is one of the most practical, relevant New Testament books. And I'm really excited about starting that as we get into September. Pray for me also as I'm trying to just seek the Lord on how we can be more effective and uh, working with Paul on that and our elders and so forth. I'd like to end with a reading of scripture that is also a prayer. And this may sound familiar to you. In fact, Paul mentioned it to me this week. He was saying, this is such an obscure place that we find this, but the, the words are so encouraging. So I'm gonna read this as our scripture and as a prayer for you this morning. It comes from Numbers chapter six and verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And that's my prayer for our church family this morning. Paul? Good morning, Valley community. We're grateful you're here this morning. We sing, our God is able. He will never fail. We're grateful that you're joining us for worship. Sing this morning.
Good morning, Valley community, and thank you for joining us this morning for worship. So thankful for our music team and these beautiful musicians that God has given us at Valley that help us participate in worship in the morning. Also thankful, Pastor Matt, that beautiful prayer of blessing that you prayed right before the music team. This morning, we look at Psalm 46, God is a perfect refuge. Two years ago, my daughter played in the pit orchestra for the musical, The Music Man. How many of you remember the story of The Music Man? Professor Harold Hill comes to town and convinces the town of River City that they have trouble, big trouble, with a capital T. I'm sure some of you are starting to sing the song in your head right now. He's actually a con artist that wants to deceive the town of River City into giving him their money. So to do this, he tries to convince the town that he's a traveling band instructor. And what the town really needs is a marching band for boys. Well, any good salesman knows that you have to create the need for a product. If you've ever watched Shark Tank, you know that's one of the things that they say, create the need for your product. And so to do this, Harold Hill convinces the town that they have trouble. And that trouble is the new pool hall and the dangers of playing billiards. So they have trouble with a capital T that rhymes with P and stands for pool. And that will lead young man to be sp smoking and drinking and gambling bums. Now, I'm not going to ruin the story for you if you haven't seen it, but the whole movie does get resolved in the last five minutes, and all is well. And all along the way, they'll be singing of ice cream, a celebration of Gary, Indiana, the song of Miriam, the librarian, and yes, even the creation of a band. If only life was that easy. Often the dangers done by con men has lasting effects and people really do suffer. And while the music is the solution to this story, often in real life music is just an escape from our trouble. What is interesting about this story is that when there is real trouble usually in life, I find there's a couple of responses. People either tend to escape the world or escape the problem, find an escape, or they want to do something about it. They get hyper-engagement in the problem or hyper-engagement into the world. A study was recently done, and I was reading about it, about stress and problems and how people deal with it. The study said that the average American spends four years of their life escaping stress. Think about that. If you add all of it together, four years of their life they use escaping stress. The number one on the list was daydreaming. Daydreaming things like, I've won the lottery, or I'd rather be somewhere else, or daydreaming. If I spoke my mind, here's what I would say. But it included many things, social media, TV, movies, <clears throat> books, music, video games, drugs, alcohol, work, food, many escapes. The second group I like to call the fixer. They want to do something about it. Find the problem, let's fix it. Argue our side, become an activist for the cause, or government change is the solution, or if we spent money in this area, we could solve it. Now, not all of the responses are intrinsically bad, but when they become our escape or our ultimate solution, they become a source of frustration instead of solution. So what is the answer to our trouble? In Psalm 46, we're going to see that the psalmist wants to try and answer this question with how the God of the Bible can be a refuge in the time of trouble. Listen to Psalm 46. For the choir director and the songs of the sons of Korah, here's Psalms 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. 
the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. A little background on this psalm. We are not told who the author of this psalm is, but we do know it was sung by the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah participate in several psalms. This is the fourth psalm of seven here in Psalm 42 through 49. The, that the Levitical singers are the author of these songs and participate in them. Chapter 42 through 49 is kind of a mini gospel narrative. They go from struggle and Psalm 42, Psalm 43. In the middle, we find salvation. And then at the end, Psalm 48, 49, we have this celebration. It's almost like a musical of the gospel. And here in the middle is Psalm 46. and starts right there. God is is. So I would like to break down the psalm into three parts this morning that it addresses. First, I'd like to look at our circumstances. Second, I'd like to look to see how the psalm dresses our God. And then last, we'll look at our response. So first, let's look at the circumstances. I think the first takeaway in this passage is pretty obvious. We will have trouble. Verses 1, 2, and 3 talk about that. Verse 1 says, God is an ever-present help in trouble. Now, you probably don't need the Bible to tell you that you will have trouble. But this is not an ordinary storm that the psalmist describes. It's an extraordinary, frightening time of trouble. He is describing what could be the worst of times. He gives the imagery of earthquakes and tidal waves, though the mountains... The most fixed and firm things on the earth should be uprooted and sunk in the ocean. In verse 6, he gives us a little more detail about it, what it looked like for him. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. Verse 6 describes the shaking of a political realm on the earth. In other words, it's a world overflowing with trouble. A lot of writers and theologians think that this was likely written during the time of 2 Kings. In 2 Kings 18 and 19, we hear the story of King Hezekiah, the king of Judah. Listen to how 2 Kings 18 describes King Hezekiah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following after him. He kept the commands that the Lord had given Moses. Well, that did not prevent King Hezekiah from trouble. We actually find out in the next few verses that King Sennacherib of Assyria had his army encamped right outside of Jerusalem was making threats against him. Assyria had conquered all the nations around and was mocking Hezekiah and his reliance on God. As a matter of fact, he sent messengers to Jerusalem with a message that the people are foolish to listen to Hezekiah and his reliance on God. And it would only be a matter of days that he would be utterly destroyed and Jerusalem and the Hebrew people with it. So you're most likely not a king. And there is most likely not a physical army on your front lawn. But many times in life, it feels just like that. Maybe it's the national crisis that weighs on you. Maybe it's your health. It could be job related. It could be money related. Maybe there are things going on in your family, or it could be just the guilt of the last argument you had. But today, this week, this month, this year, you will most likely have trouble. This author did, and it was very weighty on him. So part two, we see our God. So first he describes our circumstances, and now he wants to turn our attention to who God is. 
the psalmist starts with this and it's so powerful. God is. I think that statement alone carries so much power. That is where it all starts, the belief that God is. But what is God like? Can he do anything about it? Does he care? Let's look at verse 4 and the way the psalmist describes God. First, he describes God as powerful. Verse 1 says that God is our powerful refuge and strength. The word present is used here, and you would think that this would mean near. But the idea, rather, is that has always been proven to be true, that he has always proved himself to be a refuge. And that, therefore, we may now confide in him. The word very or exceedingly, as some translations say, is added to this to say this is emphatically true. It's not just that God is near, but he is always proven to be there. It was true in the utmost sense that God has always been found to be strong, mighty, and a helper. Verse 6 answers how he does this. The power of his word subdues the nation. He utters his voice and the earth melts away. Verse 7 uses the phrase, the Lord of armies or the Lord of hosts. Here you can see it contrasted with the nations of earth. But I think it would be good to remember that God rules not just the angels, but the stars, the elements, and everything that exists. When we call on the Lord of hosts, there is so much to that name. He is the conductor of the entire orchestra that is creation. Every atom, every molecule responds in accordance with his plan. And at his command, he sustains everything by his powerful word. Verse 8 says, come, behold the works of the Lord. Verse 9 says, he can end wars just like that. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in half. That is, he makes them useless. As we continue on, the writer knows through experience that God is with us and God is for us and that the well-being of the city rises and falls with God. When God is there, nothing can stand against. Remember where I left off with the story of King Hezekiah and King Sennacherib? His messengers were saying that their God would not save them. None of the other nations had been saved by their gods, and this will be no different. So Hezekiah cries out to the Lord and says to the prophet Isaiah, asking God to help. And King Hezekiah says, do you not hear what this king is saying about you? So Isaiah calls out to the Lord, and the Lord answers and says, I will fight for you. That night, here is what happens in 2 Kings 19. Listen to verse 35. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When the people woke up the next morning, there were all these dead bodies. Verse 36 goes on to say, So King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and left. He returned home and lived in Nineveh. I mean, talk about power. I mean, this battle was really unfair from the outset, right? One God versus 185,000 soldiers. What a mismatch. The army did not stand a chance. On top of that, God had home field advantage. I mean, he made the field that they were camped on. And talk about strategy advantage. He knew their battle plan before they even planned it. The writer of this psalm says to us, this is your God. This is the God you take refuge in. So God is indeed powerful. But second, we learn that God is peace. Verse 4 says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place, the most high dwells. In verse 4, we see the image here is a state of peace and calm security in contrast with the rough and troubled oceans. While the oceans rage and dashes against the mountains as if it would overrun them, 
the state of the city of God is calm and gently flowing river, supplying everything they need, making this place happy and joyful and peaceful. This is a figurative picture of what the presence of God is like. God's presence fills his people's lives with peace and joy. Jesus says in John 7, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flowing deep within them. Jesus picks up the river theme and says, the people of his city, if you are troubled, I have water that gives life. Jesus says, do you know the taste of this water? My very presence gives peace. And that leads us to the third part of this, God is present. Verse 5 says God is with her. Other translations say God is in the midst. You know, God loves being in the middle of things. From the beginning, his tree of life was in the midst of the garden. He appeared to Moses in the midst of the burning bush. His tabernacle was in the middle of the camp. And he wanted to walk in the midst of the camp, Deuteronomy tells us. He spoke to them from the midst of the fire at Mount Sinai. He was the fourth man in the middle of the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel. He is in the midst when two or three are gathered together in his name. After his death, when the disciples were shut up indoors because of fear of the people around them, he appeared, and John tells us, in their midst. And John later writes in the book of Revelation that he sees him standing in the midst of the seven churches. And finally, he says, in the center of the throne of heaven is where God is. As it is repeated twice in Psalm 46, the Lord of hosts is with us. God is with us. As believers, we can say, God is in me. I will not fear. You see, the idea of being in the middle is that you can't be closer to something than being in the middle of it. So I think another way to think about it is this. God is closer to you than your trouble. Let me say that a different way. God is closer than your trouble. And he's not just present, but he's a present help. Verse 5 says, God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at the break of day. I read this part, God will help her at the break of day, like God does not delay. He doesn't sleep in. As a matter of fact, he doesn't sleep at all. God is not tardy in helping us. I like what Peter said. He said, God does not delay in his promise as some understand delay. In other words, God's apparent delays are wise and when viewed correctly are not actually a delay at all. The third area I would like to look at is our response. So we've looked at our circumstances. We've looked at our God. Now, how do we respond? Our response and let's break down those responses in Psalm 46. I think the first one is pretty obvious. It's right at the beginning. We don't react in fear. Verse 2 says, therefore, we will not fear. Based on this knowledge of who God is, we are not going to fear. We're going to respond in faith. We're going to believe that God is in control. Now, you don't have to fully understand everything. You don't have to have a huge faith. We just daily confess, I believe, God, that you've got it. When you go to bed, say, God, I'm going to sleep now. You've got everything, right? When you get up, God, you got today, right? In the middle of trouble, say, I will not fear. I like the picture that Isaiah gives in Isaiah 41, 13. For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. The second response I think that I find in the passage is that we should stop fighting. Stop doing things in your own strength. Stop trying to control things you can't control. 
Stop trying to fix things you can't fix. Verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Some versions say, stop fighting. I think it's important that we take this verse in the context of which it was written. Just like Jesus spoke to the storms on the Sea of Galilee, God is saying, be still or stop fighting. Cease striving and know that I am God. In the context here, I think it seems that this word is spoken to the raging nations, a word spoken to those that are rebelling against God, just like Jesus spoke to the storms on the Sea of Galilee. But that doesn't mean this wasn't written for you. And I think you would be mistaken if you didn't think that this was for you. I think this was spoken so that the people of God would hear what God has to say to those that are in opposition to him. And as a matter of fact, I think he would like us to hear it sometimes in reference to us that are striving instead of being still. So listen to these words through the lens that God is fighting for us and with us. He is not far away. He is near and fights with us. I love this because we get to hear what God has to say, like what is going on in heaven. One of the disappointments of not being able to gather regularly with the church at Valley like we normally do is I like getting to know the new visitors. I like meeting new people that are coming to Valley either to worship or they're in looking into their discovery of God. I like to ask them questions like, where do you work? What do you do for fun? Many times when I ask people at Valley, where do you work? It seems like an easy answer. But living in the tech area of Boulder Valley, asking people, what you do for a living sometimes is a little more complicated. It is often that people will say, I can tell you generally what I do, but I'm not allowed to tell you specifically what I do. As a matter of fact, some of these people will tell me that the, when they went to interview for their job, the interviewer himself couldn't even tell them what their job was specifically. And maybe you will appreciate this, even if Sometimes they tried to describe to me what they do. I really don't understand sometimes what they're talking about. But here in verse 10, I see that as a similar picture because we get a little insight to what God is saying to the nations, a place that we've never been. We get to hear what God is saying. And God is permitting nations here to rage only in the way that work in connection to the promises he has made to those people he is saving. It doesn't mean that you and I won't have trouble. It doesn't mean that you and I won't be negatively affected by earthly people and earthly systems. But what this does mean is that above all the chaos, God is working all throughout everything together for his good to those that love him. This is one of the most preeminent truths that exists in the Bible, the promise that God works for those that wait for him. Verse 10 reminds us that striving can actually be a hindrance to God working. And so this command is for you and I also. Sometimes I need to be reminded that I may need to stop fighting, stop striving. When I go at it alone, I totally miss out. Instead of emptying myself and let God's strength becoming my strength. And the third response I see is this, take refuge. Another way to say this in verse 10 is start knowing, start experiencing God and spend less time on striving and more time on knowing. I think take refuge could be another way of saying get to know God personally. And the way we do that, I think first is through his word. The word of God is such a valuable tool. The daily interaction with God through his word is an indispensable part of the Christian life. 
and the battle is for our hearts and our minds. And so maybe we should substitute our time of striving with time of digging in and knowing God. When David said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, I think he is saying, I'm in the dark without you, God. I lose my way. I'm defenseless. But another way we can start knowing is to take steps of faith and experience God. The best way to see God show up is to take him at his word and do some of the things he says. They are all throughout the scriptures. As I was thinking of this chapter and how it plays out practically in our lives, I think this is where it is at. The word of God and our response of faith. Let me give you a couple examples and see if you understand what I mean when I say stop striving and start knowing. So maybe you've heard this, a soft answer turns away wrath. This is God's word. So the next time you are angry, you're fighting with your spouse or you're angry at your boss or you're frustrated with your parents, we run to his word in our hearts. What does God say? And I think Pastor Matt covered this a few weeks ago. They are not the enemy. We don't struggle against flesh and blood. It's a battle of the heart and the mind. How am I going to respond? Well, a soft answer, kindness. So we put God's word in our heart. And now by faith, we live them out. Or how about Lamentations 3, 25 through 27? The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So the next time that it's not happening fast enough for you, maybe it's dinner, maybe it's the kids picking up, maybe it's a project timeline, maybe you should take a break, go on a walk, renew your mind and soul and see what God says. God's probably saying, it's not time yet. Maybe you would say, I can wait. What do you want me to see in this God? And even say, it is good that I should wait. Or one last one I was thinking about taking a step forward in your faith is to be a light. Apostle Paul writes in the book of Corinthians, the Lord God said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So instead of striving, be a light. Share your story of what God has done. People need someone with good news. People need someone that loves them. Be an encouragement to someone else. Be the light they need. So con men of this world will tell you that we have trouble with a capital T and we must work, strive, vote for the right person, give money, entertain ourselves, get our own way. We must do something to solve the problem. Even crazy things like start a town band. But what does God say in this passage? What does God tell us and what does the gospel of Jesus tell us? Well, first, the circumstances or the problem is actually far worse than you could ever imagine. The whole world system stands in opposition to God like a raging sea, and all the nations of this world will fail, and all of our striving will come up short. But wait, there is good news. We learn the presence of God changes everything. With one word, he changes everything. And where he is, there is peace, joy, and that is where true refuge is found. And the key to unlocking the peace is knowing him and constantly reminding ourselves of his presence and relying on his strength, not our own. In other words, have faith, trust, and rest, and be still and get to know him more, not fearing not striving, but being still and knowing God.
find your security in his presence and strength in his promises. That is the Christian's hope. The God who promised to come close and protect his people. He's saying to you, come to me. I am your refuge. And if you find your refuge is not holding up, you're this morning searching and seeking for a refuge. If your refuge is wasting away, it's not satisfying. It's failing you. And as Pastor Matt preached last week, it feels like sand shifting under your feet. He says to you, God promises he can be the perfect refuge. Let's pray together. God you are our refuge and our strength. That is something that never changes. What changes is our hearts and minds to see that and be aware of it. Help us to daily seek you and renew our minds in your word to call out to you in time of need and know that you are the secure refuge. Help us to stop striving and start knowing and seeking you. This psalm has been such a beautiful message to our hearts. Thank you for the gift it is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.